back to uh, the AWS Summit in London. We're live on Twitch, and in this session, we're going to talk about machine learning, and we're going to focus on a service called Amazon SageMaker. Uh, I'm joined today by Dennis. Uh, hi, Dennis. Welcome hi, back. <laughs> uh, principal uh, solution architect, uh, specialized in machine learning. And we have a very special guest, uh, Adrian, who's a principal engineer at Hotels.com. Hello, and everyone. Thank you very much for making the time today. Good to be here. Uh, so actually, we're going to start with you, Adrian. Okay. Uh, so I, I guess everybody knows Hotels.com. It's a, it's a major, major uh, company, a major website, travel website. So you guys must be doing a lot of different things with machine learning. So can you give us first the, the big picture? What, what are the, maybe the top projects that you are working on, and what are you trying to solve with machine learning? Sure. So yeah, as you said, we're obviously a big company, operate on a big global scale. Um, you know, most of the data sets that we're interested in, tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of items. Yep. <laughs> and um, I mean, obviously, our, our core business is to get the right hotel in front of someone who wants to book a hotel as quickly and as smoothly as possible. So in order to do that, we need to be able to analyze the data sets, look at what the customer is doing, and then try to get them what they're looking for. So they come there wanting to, to book a hotel, and we need to be able to analyze this massive amount of data to find them the right hotel. Yeah, so I guess it's about uh, a recommendation and, and content personalization. Uh, can you tell us a little more about those? Yeah, so, so some of the things we'll be looking at when, when a customer arrives at our website is if, if we know anything about them, like the, the kind of traveler they are, if they're a business traveler or maybe someone looking for cheap hotels. Um, and then also, obviously, what they're searching for. So, and as they search, then adapting what we display to them based on models that we've trained in the background beforehand. Ah, now we get to the, yeah, now we get to the technical stuff. Yeah. So, uh, um, I know you have a, a, a really interesting use case with uh, image classification and, uh, and selecting the best image for, uh, for a given hotel. So, can we zoom in on that one and go into, uh, into details a bit? Sure. So I think that was touched on a bit earlier in the, in the keynote. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the thing is that we've got tens of millions of images of, of hotels, and these are varying quality. Some of them have been given to us by the hotel themselves, so those are generally higher quality. Or we have users who've gone there and taken photos. And that could be anything, yeah. right? It could be anything. <laughs> like it could be a shot of the bed, it could be the <laughs> coffee maker. Uh, early on, someone was saying it could be of a toilet, which might be interesting for some people, maybe less so for others. Yeah, but not, not necessarily the one that you, you want, want to display, uh, right? That might, that might not be the hero image you want to, to display, so, exactly. Yeah. So how do you solve that? So there's, there's a lot of different things that, that we look at. Um, obviously, what we'll look at is images that were displayed in the past, and then what behavior happened after that image was displayed. So if there was a, an image and no one actually clicked further to look at it, or they didn't do a booking, you probably want to rank that lower. An image that got a lot of interest, you want to rank that higher. Uh, you also want to, to you know, look at images in different ways so you have to determine the quality of them, maybe try to do a bit of machine learning to figure out what is this displaying. So there are all these different sort of data points that you want to combine together, and then ideally, you know, build a model on that, and then when a user arrives on a hotel, display what you think is going to be the hero image, right. which will then lead to a booking. And then depending on user feedback and you know, did the user click, did the user book, you, know, you, you, you figure out if that was a, a good prediction or not, and, and you, I guess you train again and again, right? Exactly, so having that, that feedback loop from interaction on the website, new images coming in, behavior, and then retrain your model, and out it goes again. So that's why I think something like SageMaker is interesting because it's, the promise is that it can do that entire loop. Yeah. And then what's also interesting for our data scientists and analysts is they do a lot of things, um, a lot of exploratory analysis. So that's where it's also really useful to have a notebook where you can just try things out, but on a massive scale, because you've got all that compute underneath you. Yeah. So if you want to try something out, you don't have to wait three days for the result to come back. You can just yeah. you know, maybe have a sip of a cup of coffee, and there your results are. Yeah, because Dennis, when you, when you actually work on machine learning, you, I mean, as I say all the time, infrastructure stand in the way, right? So how does SageMaker help? Uh, how does SageMaker help you make infrastructure disappear? In well, SageMaker is a managed service, and so one of the things that it helps you accomplish is 
train your model on a potentially distributed set of uh, instances that you don't need to manage. Uh, it's, it's sort of hidden behind you. you. You can specify the number you want, you can specify the type, but at the end of the day, you don't need to bring them up, you don't need to shut them down. And the same thing for uh, creating a training, uh, sorry, uh, an actual production endpoint, right, that you want to uh, drive predictions from. Uh, we can deploy uh, this model for you and, and uh, you can start using it by calling the service. Uh, any other, uh, Adrian, any other AWS services that come in handy for data prep or, or you know, generally building uh, machine learning pipelines? Yeah, so that's like particularly of interest to me. So I work on our data platform team. So a lot of what we focus on is getting the data and making it available to our, our data scientists for machine learning. So, you know, we use a lot of, obviously all the data stored on S3. Uh, we've been looking at using Glue for doing data prep, having a data catalog available that you can then use. Um, a lot of running Spark on top of, uh, from your notebooks. Uh, another thing that's really interesting, we use obviously a lot of EMR to do data processing pipelines and so on. Um, I think the list, the yeah, list so just goes on and on. Quite a lot, yeah? yeah. You guys are, are, are playing with all the toys, yeah? yeah? Uh, that's very good. Thank you very much, Adrian. Sure. We have an, an extra guest. Uh, we're very happy to, uh, to have you Thank here. Thank you. Hi, Matt. Mm -hmm. Very nice to meet you. you. Hi, hi. Uh, nice to meet you. So, well, you just jumped in, so I'll let you introduce yourself. And, and <laughs> can you please let us know uh, why is machine learning important for Hotels.com? Of course. So, um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Matt Fryer, VP and Chief Data Science Officer for Hotels.com, part of the Expedia Group family of brands. So why is machine learning important to us? It's absolutely vital. We operate at immense scale. Most importantly, for each and every customer, they want to find the right property at the right price. And it's fundamentally a machine learning algorithm. In addition, we have so many other use cases, whether it's from understanding the tens of millions of images we have, tens of millions of reviews, to really help you understand what the stay is going to be like, through to how to make recommendations, you know, um, travel and geography can be complex and fragmented. Right. And it's our job to make it easy for you. Um, and that's really you know, what brings us to work every day, to really help our customers and make and, them happy. And how does AWS, uh, where does AWS help the most with this? I think it's critical. So, um, if you think about, you may be seeing my uh, keynote this morning, there are three critical steps. One, I think Adrian was talking about this a second ago, is really the data. Right. It's the core underlying foundation. Unless that is amazing, this isn't going anywhere. And I think that's so we invest a large amount of our time and resources in making that great. Next, on the, if you imagine sort of pyramid, it's really the power of training and machine learning. So moving more towards streaming, and the future, I think, self-learning. The AWS stack, in particular, makes that much easier. So whether on the data piece, I'm sorry, Adrian will share more details, technologies like S3 in our data lake, Kinesis and um, Managed Kafka, EMR, for running a lot of our ATL processes, all the way through to things like Lambda, things even like the well-architected framework. So we have high security, Clearly GDPR is on everyone's mind right now, making sure that everyone's compliant. But the fact all those services integrate well. Right. You know, it's really a group. I think Amazon has the smallest board of services and capabilities. We're using pretty much every single one of those. Yeah, that's what I understand yeah. now. Yeah, um, <laughs> very impressive. And that's key. And the, the next part is things like you know, modern services to make things easier, like SageMaker, where you bring together the stack and you empower engineers and data scientists to make things easy. And when, you, when it's easy, it sparks curiosity. People are adventurous mm. and they ask different questions. They want to explore. Yeah, and that innovation yeah. sparks new ideas and new important things, particularly towards the end part of the story, which is how to de deploy in front of customers. You know, I think we've talked a lot about CI, CD, mm -hmm. continuous integration, continuous deployment. Well, I think of this world as CL, continuous learning. <laughs> yeah. so how do you deploy easily? Now, we've been using some of the technology there, particularly things like DynamoDB and DAX, right. to get sub millisecond performance levels. At that level, there's no trade off between performance and complexity. So you can offer that capability for your users, 
I do this simply as you can, with no performance trade-off. Right. And that, I think, is, is the, the rich coming together of many capabilities, ultimately to benefit our customers and our partners. Wow, this is really impressive. I mean, we're really, really proud to, to have customers like you that really push AWS to the limit and push the services to, you know, uh, to really push the envelope for those services and help, help us improve and, and, and build even cooler stuff. It's so exciting if uh, yeah. you're the user of it. So I use Hotels.com as well. Yeah, so and you, can see, you, can, you can see the results. Just go to Hotels.com and you will see all this uh, crazy stuff in action. And particularly it's global. So we have operations in 91 different countries of the world in 41 different languages. Yeah. And that's a, a real critical part of our scale. Yeah. We have to be locally relevant really important that we're right for you and whatever you're trying to do, but also globally efficient. And that's, Very that good. scale and that balance is absolutely critical. We have, to, we have to win it both if we're going to win this marketplace. So Dennis, uh, we heard about SageMaker. We have a, we have a few more minutes. Sure. And of course, you know, we have to show you that thing in action, right? Right. So uh, I think you have a demo. Absolutely. Uh, so if we could switch, thank you, to, uh, to the demo screen. Uh, what do you have for us today, Dennis? Uh, well, uh, as Adrian earlier mentioned, there are different uh, aspects of the workflow, and they're shown in the console here, right? Uh, and we'll just take a quick glance uh, at the first few steps, because clearly, you know, notebook instance and creating a notebook instance is highly important to experiment uh, with your data and experiment with algorithms. So essentially, step one here is creating a notebook instance. And I've already gone ahead and created one. You see in the console that uh, one instance is in place. So we can open it, and uh, for those who've you know, used uh, deep learning AMI and tried to set up an SSH tunnel and so on, uh, this has become extremely easy. You just click one single button, and an, an instance magically appears for you, right? And avoiding all the complexities of this stuff. So uh, here's essentially a Jupyter notebook. Uh, so if you're familiar with Jupyter, you know, what it does is it's a Python-based kind of uh, uh, you know, interpreter shell-like environment where you can you know, experiment with things. And here, if we look at sample notebooks, one of the nos notebooks we're going to use um, relates to uh, you know, XGBoost algorithm, which is one of the many algorithms that uh, you can use inside uh, SageMaker. So um, we have many different samples uh, and sample kind of applications of machine learning available. Uh, they're available on GitHub, and the same notebooks are available through SageMaker. So the one that uh, I will pick here is customer churn, predicting uh, customers who are leaving the platform, right? Or who are about to leave the platform. In fact, I've done a talk on this uh, at reInvent 2016. There was a blog post uh, uh, published, uh, but this was pre-SageMaker. Uh, and now with SageMaker, we can actually apply specialized algorithms like XGBoost, you know, tweak them and, and uh, um, you know, see the results. Um, so here's um, that uh, notebook. Um, if I click on... And of course, there is no customer churn at Hotel.com. <laughs> 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 you optimized it away. <laughs> we have such a great loyalty program. Why would you ever want to leave? <laughs> okay. And uh, there is a link if you open it to, to the blog post. So you can get a little bit more background about what's going on here. But essentially, step one is getting the data, right? We need to be able to obtain a data set, make it uh, in a form uh, that's easy for the algorithm to process. And in this case, uh, this is a well-known kind of public data set, part of a, a book that was published. And uh, you can obtain uh, that data set uh, yourself. And if you look uh, at the code, again, you don't need to understand a lot of what's going on. Uh, but clearly, it's just a, a zip file with a CSV uh, objects inside or CSV files inside, and that's all we're doing. We're unpacking them, uh, and the one that we care about is actually churn.txt um, that we're then loading through Pandas uh, library uh, in uh, uh, yep. in Jupyter, right? Usual, usual suspects. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, first we want to look at the data, right? And what we're seeing here is, you know, many many different rows uh, and about 32 attributes, if I recall correctly, uh, but some of them pertain to uh, the state of where the customer is. Yeah. This is a US-based uh, data set. The number of days that the customer has been with uh, the company, and we're talking about a telecom usage, okay. so uh, somebody who's using a cell phone uh, plan, right? And we want to be able to tell if... Okay, that's why we see 
you know, calls and charges and minutes. And, okay, exactly, exactly. But the key, thing, usage. the key thing that we want to predict is churn, sure. right? Is the customer going to leave? This is a historic data set, so we know uh, this, uh, the true value, the, the, the truth, the ground truth about all this data. And we're trying to predict this for new records, new customers that appear in the future. Now, if we look uh, a little bit further here, yeah, so this is a, a description of all the different attributes um, that go along. And really, the first thing that we're going to do is look at uh, the data, examine the data, play a little bit with it. This is uh, highly important yeah. for us. Um, and again, uh, using pandas, cross tabulation uh, of functionality here, just to plot some histograms and some percentages of how each attribute is distributed, right? right. Um, this can bring us some insights very quickly. So for instance, um, we look at the phone numbers. There are many, many individual phone numbers and it's unlikely that this is going to be very useful. Of yeah. course, you could see perhaps you know, some part of the phone number can be used to predict churn. Uh, maybe if you don't like your phone number, you might leave nowadays yeah. with, you know, mobility. <laughs> sounds, of, yeah. Right, it's, it's easy. Sounds so probably not. Sounds weird. And uh, we'll look at other things here. So let's see. I think uh, typically yeah. feature engineering, as we would call that, yep. Yep. it's critical. So whatever data set you have, always explore new variables. They yeah. nearly always add value in that approach. Absolutely. And then, tip. of course, the important one is how is the target attribute distributed, right? Sure. So we see here churn, 85% uh, of customers are staying with the company, 14% are churning, okay, I guess reasonable amount. We want to minimize that, of course, and that's the point <laughs> of uh, <laughs> this uh, Not this sure algorithm. the CFO would agree, but. <laughs> <laughs> Not a little high. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, so one of the things that we can do is then Eliminate the values that we don't care about. So dropping here a phone number, um, area code, again, may be interesting. Uh, we're actually converting it to a categorical value uh, instead of a uh, numeric uh, value that it is. Kind of makes sense. Uh, yeah. um, and we can look at various uh, types of data that are inferred. Uh, so if you see object, that means categorical, and all the other ones are numeric. Uh, and now to the more interesting stuff, uh, we're trying to figure out how uh, is the data correlating with uh, perhaps the target attribute, uh, how it is it distributed, the shape of it, and then this is, again, relying on cross-tab histogramming right. functionality. But you can see, if, if you're a data scientist, even if you don't, um, you know, if you, you've never used Jupyter, you can understand how easy it is to visualize the attributes, how valuable it is to look at it and say, okay, yeah, wow. build some intuition and like in this see case, which features are really interesting or not. I think um, the voicemail message uh, is is interesting. What you're seeing is, uh, no, I guess that's not it. But daily minutes, for example. So yeah. if you are churning, then somehow your graph becomes a bimodal graph here, right? So you're either, if you're churning customer, you're either less likely to uh, spend daytime minutes or more likely to spend more daytime minutes, but the, the middle part yeah. is, is, uh, is missing. So these are the kind of insights that you can uh, grab from uh, these uh, histograms and, and, and graphs, right? And then finally, moving on to actual correlations and, and, and scatter matrices. We I guess can, the uh, next key point is looking through those charts by eye, it's incredibly difficult to identify yeah. which one might be important by how much. And that's where machine learning really comes in. It's, it's, it gives a programmatic way to assess the difference and, and really figure out what the right prediction yeah, is. Because you could really have hundreds of columns and you yeah. know, it becomes yeah. the eyeball just impossible to handle. It doesn't work yeah. in that case. Exactly right. This is still a relatively small data set, in which case we could kind of look at it. But uh, uh, Matt's absolutely right. And here's another kind of nice visualization that you can easily generate with you know, how two variables kind of uh, correlate with each other. And you can see that you know, there's some variables that are very highly correlated with each other. And therefore, there's probably no need to include both of these variables in our training data set. So we kind of move along, drop uh, yeah, the, the unnecessary yeah. variables. We transform the attributes, right? And oops.
Mac is making it only too easy to uh, <laughs> switch move <yeah>. around. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So you transform those, upload them to S3, and then right. we're, we're ready to train, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, effectively, at this point, after all the transformations. Uh, well, we need to split them into sure. training, validation, sure. and, and testing data sets. We upload those to S3, uh, create the buckets, and then turn those into proper SageMaker inputs, making it easier for SageMaker. And here is the kind of the interesting part, yeah. is we're just saying we're going to use XGBoost, right? We're going to decide on what kind of training instances we're going to use so on and so forth. Yeah, and if we had, and if we had a huge if we had a huge data set uh, and we needed let's say 50 instances, we would just say 50 in there. Exactly, right? exactly. And so this trains the model; it fits that uh, you can then package it, deploy yeah. it, and uh, we're off to the races here. Go through the rest of the notebook; it'll show you yeah, how just, to and make predictions yeah. uh, and so on. And I want to point out all of these are available on GitHub. So if you look for Amazon SageMaker examples on GitHub. You'll find this and example right that Dennis so showed you, and yeah, and there are plenty more, and they're a great resource to learn not only about SageMaker but also about machine learning in general, right? To to sharpen your uh, ML skills, this is really really useful. I think we're out of time, so I want really really uh, to thank our guest today. Thank you again, Adrian. Thank you, very much. Thank thank you Matt. I know your Appreciate schedule time. is crazier yeah, than mine, uh -huh. uh, yeah, and, yeah, uh, and thank you for Appreciate taking the you. time to talk to us, Dennis. Thanks yeah. again. It was a really good <laughs> demo. And uh, stay with us. We have more uh, more sessions coming up on Twitch here at the AWS Summit in London. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. All right. Cheers. Cheers. All right.